Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this ISG Smart Talk. Today we are discussing customer engagement in the new future. Before we kick things off today, I will quickly run through a few housekeeping notes with you. We are recording this webinar and you can access the replay by using the same link you used to register for this event. You can also download a PDF of today's slides in the event resources section. And please feel free to submit a question at any time during the presentation by using the ask a question box on the left side of your window. With that, I will hand things off to Wayne Butterfield to kick off today's ISG Smart Talk. Thank you very much, Gillian, and welcome everybody. Um, again, great to be back on, on ISG Smart Talk. Really uh, happy uh, today to have Phoebe Cannon, uh, CEO, founder, author of 247.ai uh, with me. Welcome, PB. Uh, nice to be here, Wayne. Um, you know, for anyone who uh, has been following uh, ISG or, or, or mine or uh, PV's uh, LinkedIn feed recently, you'll know that this isn't the first time that we've been chatting. Uh, time flies. I think it's probably about a month ago since we had uh, some of our initial uh, discussions. Some amazing in insights from, from PV uh, about the industry, clients, changes, uh, uh, post COVID, um, and uh, and really keen to dig into some of those again. Again, it's another month. It's a, a month since those videos were initially shot, um, and uh, and obviously very keen to hear from the audience. What are those burning questions that you have? Uh, you know, PV being such a pioneer, and I can't wait to uh, to to delve in a little bit more about the the why message for 24-7.ai uh, for and, um, and, and dig into the, to the, to the, uh, to the brain of PV on you know, why he um, you know, set up the business, what's different about them and why that's really relevant, I think, in, in today's uh, Smart Talk. A um, couple of slides, just as a bit of an intro, it's going to be very conversational with PV throughout. Anyone who was involved in the uh, in the last smart talks that I ran, we'll, you know, we'll see the next couple of slides as being familiar from a viewing perspective. Um, but again, always good to set the uh, to set the foundation so everyone knows what we're talking about, what the terminology is, et cetera, um, so that it's uh, a, a little bit more um, you're a little bit more in the know about our thinking around intelligent automation uh, and its role in the contact center. Um, so, you know, for anyone not seeing this slide already uh, from uh, an ISG perspective, you know, we very much see two key growth areas within the automation spectrum. Uh, this area that we're calling process discovery, it involves things like speech and text analytics, process mining, desktop analytics, machine vision. We're going to talk about customer journey mapping and analytics today a little bit with, with PV. So, you know, understanding what is actually happening in an organization. That's your process discovery. And then you've got the tools that you use in order to automate what you're finding. Now, clearly not everything, um, but you know, RPA, OCR, natural language processing, cognitive reasoning and, and machine learning, and you know, a really topical um, uh, technology today, conversational AI, and we'll talk quite a bit about, about that also. Um, so that hopefully gives you a bit of a, a, a benchmark of where we are and what we're going to, to broadly dig into today. And then for anyone who, who wasn't aware of, of last uh, the last webinar that we did, um, this slide again got loads of traction on, on LinkedIn because I put it out there without actually giving any explanation. And I think it's one of those slides as we build through this that needs an explanation. You know, without the explanation, it's a really confusing one. Um, but if you imagine the business, if you imagine the contact center, um, if you think about, um, you know, today's topic, um, you know, inputs into, uh, into this discover phase, they're all about multi-channel customer and business communications. Okay? We live in email. We live speaking and communicating with each other. And it doesn't matter whether it's your colleague in the next desk 
or booth in another department or your customer at the other side of the world, like you converse, like that is how you do business. That is how you sell your product, you buy a product, you converse in some way or another. And so understanding communication is clearly very key uh, in order to understand your business, you know, whether it be internal or external. And so this wave of discovery, this whether you're using speech analytics, text analytics, process mining, understanding how your business is, is working, how it's conversing is going to be really key to understanding where you go next. And obviously, we'll talk about remove and improve shortly. But PV, I know it's something that you guys do really well. And I know it's a real um, skill set of yours and something you've been really passionate in ensuring that you have the capabilities around customer journey mapping, right? Um, so talk to me a little bit about, you know, if we talk about 24 seven and we talk about the overarching discover, like wh where are you playing? Like, give me your thoughts around, around this from your perspective. Right. So, um, I think uh, from a customer journey mapping, especially when we talk about, uh, you know, conversational AI and, uh, you know, what the consumer is trying to do. Uh, it's important to understand, you know, the various flows in which uh, consumers, you know, reach out to companies, right? So, for instance, you know, uh, what did they do just before they called the 800 number, right? Were they on your website? Were they checking something? And the reason for understanding the journey is, number one, to fix the digital assets that a company has so that the issue could be resolved where they went first, right? And also to discover what are the types of intents that a customer feels more comfortable picking up the phone and talking versus engaging with the digital assets the company has, right? And so it's really important to take the data from you know, the web logs, take the data from you know, phone systems, messaging systems, and kind of connect them together to say, you know, this is how a typical customer approaches a company given uh, an intent so that, you know, the company understands, you know, this is probably the best way to respond to the customer and take care of the issue. I'll give you an example. There are a lot of companies where, uh, you know, a customer tries to get a price quote, right? And they go to the website and typically, you know, for whatever reason, historical reasons, uh, you know, a lot of companies believe they convert better on the phone channel, right? But today's consumer may not be inclined to call you. Right. And so when you look at, you know, someone hitting a price code and then being redirected to a phone after a few questions are asked on the website, you may want to test allowing, you know, direct, uh, you know, providing the code or engaging with the customer through messaging or chat on the website and uh, test out whether, you know, the consumer responds to it. And that's why, you know, if you don't understand the journey, you're just responding to in channel conversation and you think you have the full picture. Uh, you know, the journey mapping allows you to see the big picture and more importantly, how consumers respond to different, uh, you, know, uh, you know, assets as well as prompts that you do. And it'd probably be a miss of me. You mentioned the word intent three times and I can see it three times on your book behind you. So intent, I know, is something that is, you know, it's it's part of your core, right? I mean, you're, you're so interested in intent, you know, the age of intent, uh, book authored by pv i've got my copy on the way um so definitely something if you are interested in in intent and and the science behind it and the understanding behind it definitely a, a must read so sorry i i, I heard the intent i saw the visual i had to link those two together mate <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know reason for the um focus on intent is you know, in the past, we would talk about call types, but when we talk about call types and chat types, what we really say is very broad categories like billing issues or this or that. You know, intent is much more fine-grained than, you know, if you understand at the root cost level why someone is, uh, you know, motivated to reach out to a brand, uh, you can do a lot more than say, hey, it was a billing issue. It's a lot more generic, and you really don't get to the, you know, heart of the matter. Absolutely. And I think that's really key, right? If we think about, again, on the slide, the next, you know, what discovery should do is it should enable you to do two things. You know, we're going to concentrate on remove now. And when I think about remove, I think about removing failure demand, you know. So 
you're right. Understanding customer intent, like why are they doing a certain thing? Hey, most customers don't want to contact you. Right. Uh, now they're not really that interested in having to. In fact, it's probably an annoyance. And, I, and I'll speak from personal experience. I don't want to ever contact a brand. I don't want to have to speak to a person, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. um, you might think that the amount of chatting I do on these webinars, but you know, I don't really want to spend my time dealing with something that I think should just happen. Um, and so, you know, customer journey, process mining, you name it, this understanding of what is going wrong in our business that is causing somebody to need to make contact with us. Now, clearly some contact is great, of course, uh, some contact is not so great. So, you know, reading out, using customer journey to say, this is a journey we want to facilitate. This is failure demand as a result of a broken journey is brilliant. Um, and that, that whole remove section, right? I mean, we can think about removing failure demand, but you know, you, you hit the nail on the head there. You started talking about conversational AI. Clearly, if we know the journey and we know the intent and we know what the resolution is, then conversational AI has got to be an option, right? On the remove Ooh. space. Yep. And uh, the benefit of conversational AI, if, if uh, done properly, is the speed of response to the consumer, right? They get what they want right away as opposed to waiting for, you know, agent to engage and then, you know, spend a few more minutes on, you know, uh, explaining what it is. It's kind of like, you know, getting what you want and getting out. So it's, I think it's a natural, logical next step to what we have created as, you know, the digital assets, which are, you know, the mobile apps, the uh, web pages and so on and so forth, which are incredibly rich now, right? I mean, compared to 1995, the last 25 years, most brands have enabled very effectively to do 99% of the things you want to do online, right? And that's a huge leap. And in spite of that, you know, you still have, like you said, you know, I don't think any consumer wakes up and says, I'm super excited, I'm going to call Brand X today, right? Uh, but those, you know, things do break and you need to reach out. And I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, intelligence you can gather from conversation, both about, you know, process stuff that's going wrong, but also oftentimes we miss out that those conversations have nuggets of what your competitors are doing, uh, both good and bad, that, you know, you can, you know, take away from, right? So those conversations are incredibly valuable. Brilliant. You, you touched upon messaging a few times there. Um, and, you know, you know, we spoke in the videos a good month ago and you just, you kind of threw out some amazing stats on the explosion pretty much overnight of the digital channels that, that you enable. Right. Um, and, and again, if you think about, you know, some of the challenges that we saw with COVID, you know, suddenly we saw unprecedented demand and challenges of getting bums on seats, right? And mm -hmm. so both brands and consumers change their habits pretty much overnight. And I, re I remember saying to you that, you know, I'd spent a decade in organizations slowly getting consumers to change their habits pretty much over a decade from traditional channels like voice and email mm -hmm. into online chat and messaging. And it almost felt like I'd wasted a decade of my career because all I really needed was COVID. And it probably did it did the work overnight that it took me 10 years to do. Can you, um, for those that haven't seen the video so far, I think it'd be really insightful again, just to kind of talk about some of those, some of those stats and, and some of the trends that, you, that you've seen and that obviously that you've enabled your, your customers, your clients to, to take advantage of. Yeah, I mean, the first few weeks when COVID hit, and it continues even till, till today because uh, countries like, you know, Philippines and other regions are heavy hit. And even within a country, you have uh, certain areas where, you know, pockets where, you know, there are more stringent measures than, say, other parts of the same country, right? So the uh, the supply of agents came down, at, you know, once COVID started the first three weeks by about, you know, a third to 40% for most companies, right? And so, uh, meanwhile, consumers were flocking because, you know, the, the first couple of weeks, uh, a lot of stress on consumers in financial services to go figure out how to make payments on their credit card. So, you know, obviously many uh, governments around the world were giving relief on that. And so people were wanting to make sure that they are secured, right? So just 
you know, virtually the first three weeks, our banking credit card clients, uh, both on the mortgage side and credit card side, their uh, volume shot up 300 to 400 percent, right? And then many, many scrambled to the phone systems because they were desperate to get hold of someone and then make sure that you know it doesn't affect their you know credit scores. So that was playing out. Meanwhile, the you know the brands themselves they're dealing with 40 percent less uh, supply. So, you know, to your point, some of the thoughtful companies who had enabled messaging encouraged their phone customers to go to messaging, right? And what that gave the brands was, if your intent was you know, something that you had to deal with right away, those were the ones that were going to engage directly, right away, right? And then those that could be deferred, they deferred it for a few hours, but it gave them the, you know, breathing space to go handle it, right? And uh, the second benefit, obviously, which, uh, you know, we talked about in the video series is uh, a lot of the agents who are working from home don't have private space where they can conduct phone conversation, right? Uh, and, of course, you know, with Zoom calls and everything, we are used to a dog barking, a child crying nowadays when our business meetings are going on. But that's not what the consumer expects when they're calling to, you know, get those constant interruptions. So... Brands found that, you know, hey, if they have messaging, they can not only, you know, kind of stagger the responses, but actually do it with the agent at, you know, ease and not stress out the agent going, oh, my God, someone is ringing the bell, the dog is barking, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of, you know, you know, like you said, all the factors came in at the same point and accelerated the adoption of messaging. So, Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it totally resonates on the whole. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is the the bandwidth challenges, right? I mean, yep. you know, a lot of the contact centers were, uh, you know, they probably have the best internet bandwidth in the local area, mm -hmm. and so you go from, you know, great internet uh, and and obviously amazing infrastructure to working from home with you know three megabit connection and you're expecting to take a voice call over that it's just you know customers waiting an hour to get through hey you're through to wait oh my connection's lost that customer is fuming yeah and so i guess you know again it worked for brands it worked for consumers the kind of hey let's just digital message you know one one question fire it away and just wait for your answers. No waiting around. So you can absolutely see how that works. We do have an audience question actually from Alexander. Um, and I, I think what this would be, uh, again, quite a timely one to be fair. Um, so, um, so her question is, do you see the future contact purely being digital then? Or where do you see that personal contact will remain do you see any differences between B two B and uh, and B two C? You know, I'll, I'll let you answer first. I mean, I'll, I'll chip in if that's okay. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Let's talk about B two C and B two B. You know, in B two B, you still have uh, uh, what I call uh, gradients of difference between how you know a brands do business. So there are B two B where there's a personal relationship, say with an account team, right? I don't think that structure will change. So if a company is spending you know millions of dollars with a supplier. Uh, you know, they're not going to assign you to a bot and then let you deal with it, right? So there's that relationship, true understanding of how, you know, the, your, your company operates and then making sure that the accounting, you know, takes care of your needs on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't see that changing in any time soon. Neither, neither the company receiving the services wants to change, nor do the supplier want to make that change, Right. But you do have B2B where you may be a small business uh, customer of a company like Dell or Hewlett Packard, where you, you're one of you know a million customers of Dell. Yes, you spend a lot more than the average consumer, but you're you know pretty much they treat you like you know a B2C model, right? And there in that category, you know you know the the consumers, the small businesses do prefer if there are digital tools. And if there are digital, uh, you know, aids like conversational AI taking care of their needs, because th th this is a category that's very time constrained, right? And so they appreciate it. They're running a restaurant, they're doing something, and they've got very little time to go deal with a technical issue or whatever it is. So it makes sense to actually invest and not treat that as, no, I'm going to give you a dedicated account number and long waits and so on. 
I think that model, you know, especially with COVID, has changed quite quite tremendously as well. Mm -hmm. Now going back to digital versus you know non-digital, the reality is most consumers we have done you know enough studies. They do go to your digital assets first before trying to contact you, right? And that percentage is not of eighty-five percent consistent, right? So, you know, it's not the lack of desire from consumers that's holding back digital. It's uh, to the earlier question that, uh, you know, Wayne asked, which is, do brands really understand the customer journey and do they know where to intervene and put the right kind of uh, assisted uh, channels uh, available in the channels that the consumer prefer, right? And that's where the disconnect is. Oftentimes, you know, even a chat at a website, it's one thing to make it prominently available so that you can click on it and get access versus building these walls and, you know, uh, the f fences where you really have to jump through hoops, you know, give so much justification as to why. And some websites, you know, which I find it very shameful, you have to read an FAQ before they allow you to, you know, contact them, right? Why torture the consumer through so many steps? And uh, companies who have refreshingly actually opened it up have found that after the initial burst, it kind of tapers down. People understand because, you know, if you deploy conversation AI, you can redirect them to the right sections in the website and consumers will try it out. You know, it's very uh, interesting psychologically that you know, an FAQ could explain the same thing, but if a conversational board automatically takes you to that page and says, I'm here, you know, go ahead and engage with this page. And if you have questions, you know, reach out to me. And c consumer adoption is there. So I think it's time to remove the walls and, you know, uh, make digital work. Brilliant. No, I, I agree. Um, uh, I guess the only thing to uh, to to add to, to that is, you know, there's not – it's uh, – there's so many different channels now. Um, and, uh, you know, the only the, – the one I think that's probably taken the biggest hit, interestingly, is this is face-to-face, -face, right? Uh, so when we talk about face-to-face -face versus, you know, that that feels like the channel, and you wouldn't ordinarily call that a contact channel, but certainly in B2B, yep. you know, that's a huge, that's a huge, uh, it's a huge change now. Uh, I still haven't had a face-to-face -face meeting with uh, a prospect, with a client for five months. Mm -hmm. You know, I was doing it every day, pretty much. Huge, huge shift in in that from a from a B two B perspective. Um, and I guess with regards to to consumer, um, you know, old habits die hard. I would say, um, and you know, I'm sure that although we're in this new future right now, uh, people will fall back into into older habits. Um, and uh, and and so you know, we may see peaks and troughs with regards to channel shift and, and new channels of choice. Um, but I think it will start to, to level out a, at least a little bit to, to, to kind of pre-COVID in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's ever been a single channel that's opened that has ever 100% closed everywhere. So the mix might change, but you know, every every channel is still is still going to be available or used, at least in some degree, I am sure. Um, you did talk a little bit more about conversational AI there, and I kind of want to move the slide along a little bit, because again, I think this whole notion of improve, so again, if you think about discover, let's understand what the opportunity is, remove, let's get rid of that low-hanging fruit and the simple stuff, and then improve. You know, this for me is about optimization. It's about the, not necessarily the complete removal of something, but it's optimizing what you are doing in order to be more efficient, to make an agent more efficient. In the case of you guys, I see this improve as make your bot more efficient. You have a really unique way of having your, your bot and your people work collaboratively mm -hmm. to optimize your conversational AI platform. And it's, that for me has always been one of your key differentiators and it's a really interesting mix and i don't really see this happening anywhere else talk to me a little bit about about that mix your bot and your people and why that's really important to you because i know that that was one of the most you know, that's been something you 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 thought about for a lot a lot of times so talk to me about that yeah it, it you know uh, it goes back to the fundamentals actually right the fundamental is if a consumer is reaching out to a brand, you know, you have to make that experience glow, 
right? And so it doesn't matter what channel you deploy, how you do it. It cannot be that your voice agents are the best trained and they can solve any problem and do it in a way where the consumer walks away saying, that was a great experience. It has to be uniform, right? And I think what happened with bots is uh, a lot of companies uh, they made the mistake of being excited by the technology and failed to ask the question, you know, why are we deploying this and how does it serve the consumer, right? So, you know, and, you know, uh, the, the number of bad bot implementations is very well known. I mean, the majority of them are really poorly done. And uh, a classic poor example is either the natural language models are not properly trained, uh, it's trained for a small subset of the intents that a consumer may have. With the result, it's very frustrating. And then uh, to add insult to the injury, you know, after five minutes of spending time with the bot, there is no path to get to an agent, right? So either, you know, if the bot is slightly intelligent, it may even offer an 800 number. There are many bots that go into a loop and then keep saying, you know, I didn't understand that. Can you repeat it? Right. And so I think that that whole, uh, you know, and so what happened is there was this hype uh, phase where everyone unleashed the bot and then got disillusioned because the brands didn't see any ROI. And meanwhile, you know, the web service, you know, people are, you know, kind of complaining about the bot. Right. So for, for us, you know, you know, when the technology came in, the first question to ask is if the bot has any trouble understanding something, you know, give it to the human right away. Don't attempt to ask the customer the same question because, you know, what, what you can do, the, the power of machine learning is, you know, is only enhanced by humans, right? The machines cannot understand by themselves everything. At least the technology is not there yet, right? So what, what the approach we took is philosophically is if the bot cannot understand it, give it to the human, the human corrects the bot, but continues to, continues to assist the customer and take care of the issue, right? And the nightly model updates uh, enhance the bot's capability, right? So now the bot says, oh, that means actually this intent, not that intent, right? And so that's kind of how we designed it. The other part is uh, a lot of brands that we work with have very strong conviction that, you know, certain types of intents require immediate human attention, right? And I'll give you an example. If you're, uh, you know, traveling, <laughs> it's, it's a bad example in COVID times, but you lose your credit card and you're in a, in a different country than your own, that can be very scary, right? Because you don't have any access to cash. A lot of us don't carry cash anymore. So a lot of the brands like, you know, American Express, for instance, right? They want a human agent not only to assure you, you know, sympathize with you, but to make sure to say, hey, so by the next 24 hours, you're going to get a card in your hotel lobby, right? And so that experience. But in that experience, what we decided is the bot can assist the agent. It can go, you know, bring back, leverage RPA, bring back stuff, get the workflows going. And so, you know, that's where, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or solution, right? How do you intelligently bring together the power of thought and the power of the human empathy and then take care of the experience, right? And, and I think that's really important, right? This is uh, loads of questions. So thank you very much, our audience. And we're, we're going to come to some of those soon. Uh, I think some of them touch upon the fact, you know, is this the end of, you know, the the, the BPO industry as as we know it, as conversational AI starts to take over? I think inadvertently you've answered that question by saying, well, absolutely not. No, this is a collaboration, and you know, I, I you know, I can talk at length about you know, if you think about something like RPA, loads of hype around RPA at the moment. Uh, the the media would have you believe that it's the end of the workforce. In reality, <laughs> I, I think you can count on one hand the number of actual forced redundancies that have happened as a result of that technology. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm very sure that conversational AI is going to be absolutely the, the same. Um, mo moving kind of, again, not necessarily swiftly on, but we've already gone through, you know, 30 minutes already, loads of great insight. Uh, as expected, PV. Here's a little bit of insight that we got from LinkedIn earlier. Um, so we've had a bit of a survey running, just kind of four common challenges in your contact center. And, and again, um, if we think about, uh, I, I find this one really interesting um, in that, um, you know, from a digital perspective, you know, most people agree that actually it is delivering. You know, only 14% of those that responded said actually digital hasn't delivered for us. Mm -hmm. I would say that that's not 
the capability, I would say that that's potentially their capability at deploying. Right. Um, and, and I always think in that instance, you know, if I put my, you know, I'm a, a dab hand on my iPhone. If I put my iPhone in the hands of my three-year-old, she's very good at doing three things. Uh, <laughs> and that's it. Is that, does that mean the iPhone's bad? No, it means that she's not skilled to make the best use of the tool that she's been given. So that's one. And I know that one would be really interesting for you. Challenging KPIs. Now, again, we mentioned about uh, agent KPIs. Again, let's 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 delve into that a little bit. Because um, if I think about and what I, what I guess the the concepts of this question was, if you're stripping out all the easier things, if you're removing all the easier things, if you're improving um, the you know the, your bots, you know you're taking out all of the easy stuff, and you're just left with a complex. Uh, res uh, residual contacts, in theory, most of your KPIs are going to get worse uh, on the face of it. Why? Because it's going to take you longer to resolve. Your right first time is probably going to reduce all of these things because all the things that were propping up your KPIs, the quick calls, the really easy ones to resolve, well, the bot's doing that. Um, so again, an, an interesting one, you know, one in one in five, I guess, saying that actually, you know, KPIs are one of the big challenges we have in our contact center. I want to, I want you to talk a little bit though about post COVID, and what you've seen in re, with regards to agent KPIs, because it shocked me to be fair when we spoke before. Mm -hmm. In my head, I had, oh, every KPI is going to go down. Agents are just going to be you know, worked to the bone, hate working from home. What was the reality though with you guys? Yeah, and you know, look, um, you know, the Asian community, uh, you know, do have a, you know, what I call a stronger team affinity than most other teams, right? So, you know, without a doubt, the, you know, Asian community struggle with that camaraderie part, which is, you know, you're like, you know, with your mates, you look around, you have your colleagues, and then you can ask for help and someone will help you that aspect I'll come to it. But the other aspect that we don't talk about is it's also a very stressful environment, right? There's a supervisor hovering around you. Uh, you know, commuting can be a stress because, you know, agents tend to commute long distance than the average, you know, uh, you know, white white collar worker. So those things went away and the feedback we got, you know, and we went into because we had such shortage due to COVID fears and not getting enough computers home and so on and so forth, uh, you know, what we discovered is uh, the pain of commute is so much and they spend on average at least an hour each way commuting that once that was taken away, the factor of, you know, someone hovering around and putting pressure on performance was taken away, uh, performance actually improved. They were far more relaxed. Uh, they didn't have to like, you know, uh, make eye contact with the supervisor who's like saying, oh, you know, what's your AHD? Uh, that all that stress went away and they just, you know, started working. And, you know, in fact, not only did the performance related KPIs improve, their productivity improved as well, right? Which was something what was a shock to the entire system, right? And so uh, what we then quickly did was we brought in some specialized tools that allow for, you know, they want to do a karaoke, a virtual karaoke or virtual drink session. So they can at the team level decide what they want to do. And obviously, you know, in agent schedules, breaks are built in, lunch breaks are built in. So people just go into small groups and do activities. And so it's become like super creative, actually, because you've unleashed everyone to do what they want to do, as opposed mm -hmm. to more prescribed things that are done in a contact center, right? So it's kind of very fascinating. Look, you know, uh, Wayne, you know, we all have to admit we've learned quite a bit in the last five months. Uh, it's almost five years worth of learning with so many assumptions just... Uh, falling apart, right? Uh, I mean, it's always been a long-held assumption that uh, agents cannot be successful working from home. They need supervision. You know, security is an issue. Uh, so many things that, you know, we were all, we took it for granted, had to fall apart because there's no way other than working from home that's going to be a sustainable solution during COVID, right? Absolutely. I mean, Again, I'm, I'm, uh, my, my first uh, thought uh, on the back of that is uh, what would be your go-to karaoke song on these virtual karaoke's? And have you joined any of the teams so far? Because I bet that would be quite a shock.
uh, <laughs> you, you join in and uh, built it out. Uh, I don't know. You tell me, but uh, yeah, I thought that that was uh, this great, isn't it? I mean, you wouldn't even thought about about something like that um, months ago. I mean, we did a virtual escape room. I mean, an escape room in theory is something that you do in a physical environment. It was a great, great experience. You know, a, a virtual team day. And we did a virtual uh, escape room. So completely resonates with me how, how again, new things, new, uh, new ideas. Uh, I bet, you know, for some organizations like virtual karaoke type technologies, they're, they're absolutely booming right now. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, in, in every crisis, there's a winner. Um, so, uh, it, it, you know, that's always, always interesting. Um, we've got so many questions. I don't want to spend too much time on the, on the rest of this. But again, you know, we saw nearly a quarter, or just over a quarter of people talk about inconsistency in agent skills and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Again, we know conversational AI. You know, the one thing that, you know, again, really resonated with me when we spoke before, automate your best advisor, and then your automation is your best advisor. Uh, you know, you're replicating your best versus your worst. I mean, that's got to hold, you know, real value moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, one of the big mistakes when, when people deploy conversational AI is they come up with scripts themselves, as opposed to observing uh, for a given intent how your best agent would go about solving it. And human conversations cannot be scripted, right? And we, you know, we all hate agents who sound like uh, scripted machines. So why would you allow a machine to act so scripted, right? And so, um, you know, I, I do think that uh, taking the transcripts of the best agents, studying it, and then designing something with the help of, you know, someone with a background in designing conversation, like a script writer, is a much better approach. Because the key is, you know, you're trying to get the problem resolved. It's not to show the brilliance of your AI technology, right? Absolutely, cool. And then, and then, last but not least, on uh, on that was the contact center. Probably the, the the biggest challenge in the contact center: data, data everywhere, but not a piece of insight in sight. Um, and you know, we spoke about the discover phase. We spoke about um, a journey mapping, process mining, all of these things. They're all geared towards assisting uh, with that particular problem. Right. Um, we, you know, we now have got uh, probably about 20 questions that have come in from the audience. So there is plenty for us to, to get through here. And and we've got another 20 minutes left. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start uh, just talking through some of these questions and feel free to, to fire some more over uh, any, anything, anything that you want to hear more about based on today's discussion. Um, like great question from from Tim here, um, and and one that you know resonates uh, really really strongly with me as well. Why did so many organisations turn off every channel other than voice when it you know when when, when the crisis hit and demand went through the roof? You know, why was voice the default? You know, we spoke about voice being the channel of most challenges, connectivity, background noise, significant hold time for customers. Why do, you know, what's your view on why brands did it? Yeah, I mean, we work with some of those brands who did it, right? So uh, the, the you know, answer is uh, they were not ready to do messaging. So they, you know, some of them were having, let's say they have a region population of 5,000. They probably had 50 people doing messaging and was more of, uh, you know, like, let's do it. It's kind of fashionable to say I'm in messaging. So they did it. And when crisis hit, uh, they, the, all the channels got overwhelmed. So they quickly, instead of moving voice agents to messaging, which would have been logical, they panicked and said, voice cues are like, you know, the wait times are horrendous. So let's turn off messaging and release this 50 people to the voice channel, right? So, uh, but after four weeks, when we sat with those clients, they said, we really kind of messed it up. We should have done the other way, right? Uh, even though we had 50 agents and yeah, we'd have to train other agents to handle the messaging tool, 
that would have been far more effective if we had converted you know a thousand to messaging and we could have taken more volumes as opposed to the phone queue and you know like you pointed out earlier in the conversation a lot of those phone calls after a few minutes you know it just disappeared because of bandwidth issues and so on so i mean you, you can see you know every brand uh, that is doing phone support has taken a big hit in nps in the last few months right i mean you know including amazon right so you know that you know uh, it's a, it's a big issue because i don't think one no one was prepared clearly Two, they did uh, things that are not, you know, intuitive. Because, like Tim's question clearly says, you should have well gone the other way, right? So, uh, but I think uh, you know most of the companies have learned their lessons. So I think you know they're, they're you know, you'll see a lot more jumping into messaging and expanding it in the coming uh, months. Let's hope so. I mean, uh, as you say, there were so many. I mentioned it before, like old habits die hard, right? It's the it's the area where I guess the brand that closed things off just felt more comfortable. And as you say, despite the fact that they actually decreased their uh, answering capacity by moving away from messaging into voice, you know that's the step that they felt most comfortable with. And you know it's not unique to uh, even to covid you know it, it's 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 been you know, things like that i've seen over the years working in the mm -hmm. in the consequences that i have it just happens right but um but but you know it was i guess there are other brands who fully embraced it so certainly wasn't a broad brush but you know for those that that did make that switch i can understand why although i you know as as a customer i'd be pretty peeved off that you're making me wait on hold versus one and done uh, via, via a digital channel. Um, great question from uh, Anshul. I probably one I will, I will, I will, I'll answer first if that's all right. Just, yep. um, you know, are we looking at a future of unattended automation or attended agent using backend tools automation? Um, you know, some, something very close to, again, to my background is the, is the use of, you know, let's, let's talk about this being, I presume it's RPA, uh, virtual agent, desktop assistants, you name it, plenty of different names out there. Um, if I go back to, you know, the improve section of the of, of slide four, and again, the slides are available for download. Um, you know, the whole improve thing is to help an agent with aspects of a potentially quite complex conversation. Uh, and, you know, I'd say that there are three types of say robotic process automation you've got unattended you've got attended and you've got assisted uh, and each of those has i think a specific role to play in most organizations i would say the attended or the assisted is the one that probably has most value in the contact center and people would you know ask me why and i would say that you need the immediacy yeah you you know uh, you may be saving 30 seconds on a call so if the action takes longer than the saving you've actually elongated the time that you are dealing with that request versus saving. So, you know, I, I'm a big believer that assisted and attended automation are the, are the way to go in that particular space. And I feel that, you know, as we, again, going back to the agent KPI question, um, agent KPIs and, you know, AHT is not going down, it's going up. It's going up because there's extra complexity. And so you need to help the agent and that's either helping them do things quicker or it's helping them give them knowledge um, so that they're able to resolve that query a lot quicker. So, you know, the the agent and the role of the agent, I think, is going to really change. The more and more, you know, PV and the guys at 24-7 optimize the, the client bots, the more complexity is going to be left over. So, you know, the agent role is going to become in, increasingly more complex. Uh, and therefore, they need additional technologies in order to uh, to assist them. Um, there's a couple more questions actually around uh, around the BPO industry, yeah, and uh, and I'm, I'm going to add a little bit here to um, to the question. Um, BPO versus uh, captive. Um, like, give me your thoughts on on that. Like, who, who's the winner? Who's the loser? You know, is this the end of or it, has is COVID going to change the way organizations think about having a captive sector? Is this a good thing for BPO? So that's the first kind of question, PV. 
And the second bit is, does the reduction in the future of um, manned contact, does that start signaling a bit of doom and gloom for the BPO contact center industry as a as an overall as an overall? Um, so I guess two key elements to that question. Really keen to get your thoughts. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So on the captive versus you know BPO, I think um, you know uh, if you think about the share of captive to BPO, the BPO industry has gained a lot in the last 20 years, right? Traditionally, companies that would never outsource, not only did outsource, in some cases, they offshored as well. So uh, so that presented uh, an opportunity for the BPO industry. But, uh, you know, 100% captive, uh, it's a minority of companies that are 100% captive, right? So pretty much everyone who do captive, you know, do supplement with, uh, you know, the flexibility and the new thinking that comes out of the BPO industry, right? So, uh, so you know, it's very rare in my client base of about 150 clients, I'd say less than, uh, you know, 10% or 100% captive, right? Now we'll talk about the BPO industry itself, but, you know, without a doubt, and, you know, Wayne, you mentioned this, uh, the bots are going to take some volume away, right? And other pieces of, you know, already the the digital assets that the companies are deploying have taken away all the simple stuff, right? No one uh, reaches out to UPS or FedEx and goes, where's my package? You see the status online, right? You, you only call UPS even, the, you know, the status says it's been delivered and you, you, you look outside your own and there's no package, right? That's when you contact UPS. So, uh, without a doubt, the complexity of issues are going up. <clears throat> but <clears throat> there's also, you know, an interesting thing that, you know, we talk about, which is if you take stagnant industry, where there's no competition, right? And I'll give you an example. Electric utilities in the U.S. don't face competition. Electric utilities in the U.K. face a lot of competition, right? <clears throat> so what you find is electric utilities in the U.S. have, for, uh, you know, state of California, you know, the electric provider to the state with about almost 40 million people, you know, has a contact center with less than, you know, a thousand agents, right? And then if you compare in contrast to what you have with the British Gas or, uh, you know, the other companies in the UK, you find they employ thousands and thousands of agents. And so uh, a vibrant industry just creates more contact because there's so much change going on, right? Pricing plans change, you know, promotions are going on. Competitors hit you with something and then you react to it. Uh, and then you had the you know advent of smart meters, so much innovation that goes on, right? Th that creates new contacts, right? Because something goes wrong with it and you know it creates contacts. I'll give you another example. Uh, Hilton <clears throat> announced uh, integration with Alexa for you know making reservation using your points, right? And overnight, you know, ten percent of their contacts was about how to set up Alexa with your Hilton account, right? So contacts keep coming up because of changes and you know innovation. And then there's also a new set of companies that crop up like the on-demand companies uh, like Airbnb, like Uber, like Lyft and Deliveroo and others, they have created you know, more opportunities for BPO industry, right? There's literally tens of thousands of agents, which you know in the old days of takeout to modern digital takeout, has actually created a massive demand for BPO industry, right? So I think there's puts and takes. Without a doubt, automation makes inroads into agent population, right? If you take a, a company that doesn't face that much competition, uh, you know, these tools will definitely reduce the agent headcount. But if you look at the BPO industry as a whole, as long as the economy is creating new sets of companies and, uh, you know, new changes and in innovation goes on, Unfortunately, you know, day one, you don't have all the answers when you innovate something and offer it to the public, right? A contact center is a place where you receive those issues as well as, you know, opportunities that come around. Hopefully that makes sense. Brilliant. No, no, it does, mate, it does. Um, let's have a look. Renee's great question here from Renee. Uh, again, it's kind of post-pandemic, but she's saying, is there a need for every company to remap their customer journeys? in the post-pandemic world. So what, what do you think about that? Is there, has there been enough change to warrant that? Yeah, at least in the first, you know, eight weeks, there were, you know, um, the, the contact distribution kind of started skewing. So certain intents suddenly became very high in volume, right? So there was a need definitely to kind of understand what is changing with COVID 
And there's also an underlying motivation that's changing, right? Uh, which is a lot more, uh, you know, desire for human contact, a lot more, uh, you know, need for reassurance because there's so much uncertainty that's going on in the environment, right? So companies understood that. The brands that understood that well executed on it, right? Because they, you know, there are you know brands that we work with that did proactive reassurance. Right. So, you know, there's no need for a contact. They just contacted and said, hey, how are you guys doing? You know, is there anything we can do? And that made a difference. Right. So I do think that uh, as COVID unrolls, we're not done yet. I mean, you know, we're in like whatever phase it is. Um, it's smart for companies to, you know, hold the thought that, yeah, my contacts have gone up and I'm facing it to going, you know, what is happening in the broader environment and how can we support the consumer in time of need? Fantastic. And you kind of touched upon it a little bit. I'm interested in your view on the gig economy. Um, like, what is, your, what is your view on this? Like, what is the, what is the future, actually, of the agent? And, and you know, we, we think at the moment of an agent, you know, whether they're working for a BPO, whether they're working in a captive, whether they're working in-house, their role is nine to five for one company. Do you, do you see do you see a, a, any changes? What are the what are the underlying trends? Are you thinking about agent as a certain not necessarily agent as a service, but almost like gig work around your agents? And you know, do you think that is is something we should be thinking about as part of future customer engagement? I mean, you know, there's uh, you know, if you take contact centers and you know, let's take the classic problem of pizza ordering, right? Today, of course, it's all online. But traditionally, that required a contact center with, you know, where the volumes all come in between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. and you're done, right? So uh, in the early 2000s, there were uh, companies that were offering the, you know, at-home agents for just pizza ordering. And it was actually an auction, right? You, you, you know, being Pizza Hut or Domino's can say, I need 500 agents. And then the system will come back and say, well, you have to pay $20 an hour. <laughs> and then I'll make 500 available, right? So it was kind of a you know good exercise. There. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been automated, so you don't need it. The challenge has always been the training time, and it goes back to your earlier point. As things become more complex, agents have to spend a lot more time in the classroom and in training and refreshment training, right? So it's almost like in every month, an agent is spending about 10 hours getting trained on brand and the changes that are going about. So the question then becomes, you know, it's not as easy to, you know, model a gig economy, right? But what you could do is you could certify a lot of people for two or three brands. And as long as they do, you know, self-directed uh, refreshment training and qualified, they can come in for peak times. You know, there are like, you know, Uber drivers and uh, delivery drivers who only work on Friday and Saturday, right? Uh, so... You could have like, you know, that spare capacity where someone is doing uh, another job and they go, I can get paid very high during these peak times. And that definitely is, uh, you know, something that uh, will play out uh, as, you know, as you point out. So uh, that's one that's on our radar as to how to thoughtfully do it, uh, because there are the challenges on, you know, the first investment a gig worker has to do in training. Right? That's a lot of you know, time that's being spent. Uh, so for more complex industries and brands, it's it's probably not a good solution. But if it's only you know order status and dealing with payment issues and so on, you know one or two days of training, and probably it can be used across brands in the same vertical, then it's a brilliant idea, and it definitely adds to the mix of you know I can do some hours with DoorDash, I can do some hours with 247.ai, and I can do some hours with someone else, right, and maximize the earnings. So. No, absolutely. I think you know it's 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 interesting. You look at the the numbers in the gig economy just in the U.S. alone, and it's you know it's in the tens of millions. Yeah. Uh, it's you know definitely a trend. I think that's going to continue to to increase as we become very kind of on demand, just in everything that we that, that we do. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, again. Uh, you know, really value uh, time spent with you. Um, you know, great, great uh, conversation as always. Fantastic questions from from the audience. Um, the replay will be made available in the in the not too distant future. 
Um, so I'll thank you. Uh, I'll hand over to uh, back to Gillian, I believe, uh, to close us out. Uh, and thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. This does conclude our time today. We appreciate you joining this ISG Smart Talk. As mentioned, the recording of this webinar is available at the same link you used to register for the live event. If you have any questions or would just like to get in touch with us, please reach out to us at www.isg-one.com. Thanks very much for joining.